Good afternoon, welcome back. You are joining one of the classes or segments in the class called Living in Grace. Um, we're heading towards the latter part of this class, actually. Um, we have today's topic about forgiveness and then conflict and resolution, and we top it off with the important topic and rightfully placed as the last topic. Uh, it's the climactic topic, if you will, worship. But today we're taking a look at the topic of forgiveness. If we're going to live sanctified lives, if we're going to live in grace, you can perhaps understand quite quickly that it would be an oxymoron. It would be a contradiction, a unacceptable paradox if we would claim to be Christians, claim to have received God's justifying, sanctifying grace through the imputation that means that God declares from his side as the judge that we are his freed, forgiven children. If we claim that to be men and women who don't forgive others of the things that they have done wrong. And so as God has forgiven us of a debt we could never pay, then that makes us grateful or should. And we become kind and forgiving. We have that disposition created by the Holy Spirit, enabled by the Holy Spirit to be quick to forgive others. As, my, as, a, as a pastor over the years, especially here in this environment where the senior citizens live, the elderly, um, on a number of occasions I've spoken with some of those men and women, Christian people, um, various degrees of spiritual maturity, undoubtedly, but it has struck me several times how people who are now 90 years old, sometimes or more, are remembering things of this as if it happened yesterday. Things that were said, things that were done to them um, by their parents, who are long gone by now, perhaps siblings, uncles, neighbors, teachers, they remember it very vividly. And they have had a hard time letting go of it. So a lot of people struggle with forgiveness, especially when it concerns serious infractions, serious um, violence, whether verbal or physical or sexual, uh, that was perpetrated against people. Giving forgiveness more naturally to people requires then that we have a growing awareness of God's marvelous grace and love and holiness toward us in Christ Jesus. So how does God's grace pass from us to others when it concerns specific issue of forgiveness? I want to read to you a short passage from Paul's letter, this time to the Ephesians, city of Ephesus in what is now modern day Turkey, uh, was a large city uh, of central importance, both culturally, politically, economically, um, and there was a, a following of Christ believers. And to them, in the section on the way wives and husbands ought to relate to one another, he says to the husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle 
or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. That's just a um, portion in the letter to the church in Ephesus where the Apostle Paul applies the principle of grace having freed us from ourselves. Not to mention from the just judgment to come, but the grace has also had a way of freeing us from ourselves. And now we are free to love God, free to serve our neighbor. And it is within that context of gospel freedom that husbands and wives learn little by little how to relate to one another in a God-glorifying way. Of course, not everybody is married. You may be single. You may be too young to be married yet. Of course, the teachings apply to all of you as well. To all of us, the Apostle Paul writes a little bit earlier towards the end of chapter 4, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. And then verse 32 in chapter 4, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. There are several things that stand out in this last verse, and it is, of course, quite straightforward. We all have a pretty clear sense, I think, of what it means to be kind. You don't bark at a person to do something like you would bark perhaps to a dog. But a human being gets treated differently with respect. And so be kind to your children. Be kind to your wife. Be kind to your husband. Be kind to your boss. Be kind to your employee, your servant. Be kind. And be compassionate. Try to understand what that person is going through, the situation that he or she finds themselves in. Be understanding. Come alongside them. Help them in their suffering. And then it says to one another. Be compassionate to one another. That little phrase, one another, is a description of one of the characteristics of the church, the attributes of the church. It is a communion. It is a fellowship. It is a family. It is a one another. The church is not made up of the total sum of individual people who profess to be Christians. The church is God's adopted family. None of us should have belonged to this family. None of us could have belonged to this holy family, this royal family, had it not been for the grace of God. So it is by the grace of God that we're called out of this world into the family of God, and we're called to be kind and com compassionate and forgiving each other. Forgiveness goes both ways. Sometimes in a marriage relationship, it can be that due to the dynamics of husband and wife personality, um, that one of the parties, let's say the wife, 
is the one who ends up asking for forgiveness all the time. And the point comes where you, as an outsider, ask yourself, and what about him? When is he going to humble himself and ask his wife for forgiveness? In the family of God, the one anotherness of the church presupposes equality. Equality between men and women, servant and other relationships that we may have, equality before God. Different roles in the world, but equality before God. We are one another. The poor eat with the rich at the supper table of the Lord Jesus, and the rich eat with the poor. And depending on your practices in your churches, the rich person washes the feet of the poor person, and the poor person washes the feet of the rich. Isn't that beautiful? And the reason, the motivation is given at the end, why do we do these things? Why are we kind and compassionate? Just as in Christ, God forgave you. God in Christ has forgiven you. So now you and I are under obligation to extend that forgiveness to those around us, particularly in the church. Forgiveness is not easy. Forgiving a person is hard because you have to overcome your own pride. You have to overcome the, the obstacles that we face, especially when we have done wrong towards another person that might be even more difficult, where we have to admit wrongdoing. Whether we have offended someone or another person has offended us, the Bible makes it clear, forgive one another. It's the calling and the duty of every sinner filled with God's grace. And it is, again, the gospel that empowers us to forgive. It is the gospel that I just read to you, not the law in the sense of the law only being able to show us our sins and condemn us for it. It is the gospel that declares us free and freed from God's just condemnation. We have been forgiven, so we forgive those who have sinned against us, as the Lord Jesus mentions in the prayer he taught his disciples. We sometimes hold a grudge, and we hold that grudge for a long time. Sometimes people take it into their graves. Hard feelings are difficult to shed. Am I supposed to forgive that person who, who abused my child? Um, I know of a situation where a brother in Christ um, committed an atrocious crime against a younger person. And it was not sexual abuse, by the way. And that sin leaves a scar on him for the rest of his life. Nevertheless, God's grace is greater than any and all of my sins. Isn't that one, one of the popular hymns in the English language celebrates? God's grace is greater. Let God's grace move you to not hold on to grudges. 
leave them at the cross, leave them with Jesus, and determine for yourself to be done with it. Because these tend to be things that weigh you down. They are like blocks of stone and rock that you carry with you on your shoulders as you walk through life. You become a person who is not a joyful person, a person who is known to be ready to forgive, ready to sympathize, ready to empathize with others. Sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from other people. Sin also condemns us. We all have sin in us. And that very sin condemns us in God's sight. Excuse me. But it is the grace of God that triumphs over sin. The gospel is the testimony that grace and forgiveness start with God. The initiative always lies with God. And from there, we understand what is our duty towards those around us. The church is that wonderful place, that unique place in all the world. It is a storehouse, a dispensary, where God's love and mercy and grace mingle as it were, with the blood which made it possible, the shed blood of Jesus shed on the cross, so that marriages and families and church families and communities where we live, even countries, can become transformed into places, into cultures, where the Lord God is known and experienced where his love is known and shared with others so that we have a witness that goes into all the world that there is a better way to live. And people often talk about that they hope for a better world. Well, the best is yet to come. The world without end, where there is no sin, no need to forgive anymore, but that hasn't come yet. Until that comes, we are called to be agents of grace-filled sinners who help to transform life inside us, life around us, and in the world at large. That is our mission. So am I a forgiving person? Am I growing in that role of being a forgiving person? Am I growing in my role of being a person who is quick to empathize, have compassion before I am quick to judge and condemn? For that we need the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. And for the Holy Spirit to be powerfully at work in our lives, growing us in grace so that we can walk and live in grace. For that it is necessary that the gospel now broadly understood as the whole entire Word of God, takes a central role in your and my daily lives. It is my prayer that God will give us the desire to be a forgiving person, the desire to live in reconciled relationship with God from foremost, but also with our neighbor. Sometimes we take God's forgiveness for granted. It takes sacrifice. It takes a deliberate, thoughtful commitment to use each day and to be aware and alert to opportunities that God would give us to be men and women who are gracious, who are compassionate and kind and forgiving. Let us not hold on to old grudges, but if you say that you have been forgiven by God, then be bold, 
and be courageous and ignore your feelings and sentiments, however powerful they may be, when you contemplate all the wrong that was done against you. But you have no choice in this matter. We're called to be agents who forgive. And when the other person has not come to you yet to ask for forgiveness, it is your prerogative standing inside the grace of God for you. It is your call. It is your calling to forgive and leave the other side for the Lord to take care of. The other person may never ever come to you and ask for forgiveness. That is the business that he or she has with God. Yours is to forgive and to erase the debt this person person owes you there is no better way than to have a heart that holds no grudges but is instead filled with a passion for God and also the passion to live out the grace of God in our dealings with fellow humans and be human beings so as homework concerns, think of one or more persons you need to forgive. Think about what is the main issue that created the rift between you and the other person. What is it that this person violated? How were you wronged? How did you wrong another person? Can you remember? And if you had the chance, what would you tell this person? Whether that person had wronged you or you had wronged them, what would you tell them? What was your specific gripe with them before you render your forgiveness? That is, that is, by the way, not absolutely necessary either to hash through all the old stuff before you render forgiveness of another person. But it is good to be aware of what it is exactly so that we have the right proportions in our minds of what it is that we're actually seeking forgiveness for or rendering it to a person. Describe your own debt before God. How is it far greater than the debt that, of people who have accused you of, do, of wrongdoing? Is it possible that your need to get even or hold people accountable arises from a too small view of God's holiness and forgiveness of you? Have you, in other words, shrunk the importance and place of the cross of Christ in your life? These are some challenges that I leave you with. May God give you a rich blessing as you sort things out in your mind, in your memory of things that require your forgiveness by either giving it or receiving it. But know, regardless, that in Christ, God's everlasting forgiveness rests on you, not because you deserved it, but only because of his grace, his mercy alone. Thank you for your attention. Next time, we'll look at lesson nine, about the matter of conflict and resolution. So you can understand that this follows on the lesson about forgiveness that we just looked at today, and it is certainly related. How do we live in this world where you need to not only give forgiveness, but the practical results of sin are such that relationships often are ruined, destroyed, 
in disrepair and how do they become reconciled? That's what we'll look at next time. God bless you.